Each presenter has 25 minutes with five minutes of questions. Our first presenter is Nate Roberts. Nate, if you can start loading up your presentation, that would be great. Um, oops, what kind of happened? start recording. Okay, so um, Nate, uh, I'll give you a private chat when you have five minutes, one, uh, three minutes and one minute remaining. Um, and on that note, I will let you take over. Great. Thanks, Justine. Uh, hello, everybody. My capstone project, I am going to be looking at tracking pluvial related expansion and contraction of water bodies in the South Dakota prairie pothole region. So before I begin, just a brief outline on uh, what I'm gonna present here this morning. Uh, first, I'll just present some basic background information. Uh, we'll, I'll cover a little bit of the study area, discuss the project goals and objectives, uh, the preliminary methodology that um, we're using, some initial results that we have found, and where we're gonna take this project, hopefully, um, to the, at its conclusion. So just to begin, um, my overall area of interest is the prairie pothole region. So what is that? It is about 900,000 square kilometers um, encompassing the map on the right of your screen. So it covers um, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, some of Iowa, Montana, and a three Canadian provinces. And what makes the landscape unique is it's dominated by these depressions and low spots that were formed during the last glaciation period. And 90% of the private land in this area is actually used for some form of agriculture. So be it um, row crops, corn, soybeans, that sort of thing, or for grazing pasture land, feedlots for cattle, and so on. But in addition to that, it's also a pretty important uh, habitat and flyway for birds. There's a, it's a pretty important flyway for uh, Canadian geese and that sort of thing in the area. Uh, the landscape is also susceptible to exchanges in climate, especially extreme changes in precipitation. So just some background on the pluvial years and a pluvial uh, month is defined by Fiddle and Delworth as a time period where average precipitation exceeds 40% of the monthly average. So it's a really extreme climate event resulting in lots of deluge from rain and so on. And it's generally accepted that the Prairie Pothole region experienced this phenomenon in the early 1990s. And this has resulted in the formation and expansion of water bodies. So formation of new water bodies as well as expansion of existing ones. And what appears to have resulted is that farms, uh, land, and roads and towns have been flooded by this. So um, if you look at the photos on the right, I took those in the field a couple weeks ago. So the top one um, used to be someone's farm place, which has now been taken over by this water body. And then in the lower uh, right corner, this appears to have been a feedlot for raising cattle, which is now also flooded. And, and what's interesting about this area is past studies have examined the prey pothole region in response to pluvial precipitation but on much smaller scale so past work has involved um, single lakes um, devil's lake in north dakota or a complex of lakes the wabe complex in eastern south dakota so at a much smaller scale that i'm hoping to do eventually so current climate conditions within the prairie pothole region it's generally accepted that we're now in a dry climate condition. Um, in fact, current year-to-date precipitation amounts indicates the prairie potholes actually in drought conditions. So if you, the map to the right of the text there um, is from the National Drought Survey Monitor uh, just a few weeks ago, and South Dakota especially is experiencing anywhere from moderate to severe drought. And field inspection suggests that these water bodies are actually retreating. So the photo on the far right I took again a few weeks ago, and you can see that there was once a higher water mark at this um, water body than is currently being observed. So the study area that I'm going to hope to analyze is the South Dakota Prairie Pothole region. 
and that is dominated by row and crop and pasture land. Um, the map on the right I made from the National Land Cover database. So there is a fair amount of cropland and also pasture land. And this area, interestingly enough, composes about the almost all the suitable ground for row crop production in the state. Um, so to the west of this area, beyond the Missouri River, which divides South Dakota in half, you have uh, a noticeable a lessening of average precipitation. So you'll have a lot of grasslands not suitable for row crops. So ag has a $25 billion annual impact on the state economy. So any disruption um, to that could have a profound effect. And also they would be interested in new means of management um, in addition to that. So my overall research question are: is, are the areas that have been reclaimed or those areas that have seen water bodies disappear being farmed? And if so, what is being grown there? And to help, I guess, answer that question, I've come up with several project goals and objectives. The first of which is to quantify the farmland gained or lost to these water bodies within South Dakota Prairie Pothole region from 1986 to 2016. And like I mentioned before, it's generally accepted that climate conditions have resulted in these areas being flooded as of 1990s. So starting with 1986 should give us a good baseline to see what existed before that time and if that phenomenon is returning as we move more toward the present. Second, uh, to quantify the spatial and temporal relationships between the expansion and contraction of pluvial water bodies and precipitation received from 1986 to 2016. So I want to see if I can statistically, uh, if there's a significant relationship between a period of time where precipitation was received in the region and the um, how much land area these water bodies have amassed during this time period. And third, again, to determine what crops are currently being produced in the areas that have seen these water bodies disappear or retreat. And the fourth goal is to develop an automated framework for future studies involving large data sets within this region. Um, I'm going to need 30 years worth of imagery, so obviously it's quite a large data chunk, so I want to try to automate as much of the analysis as I can. So that is. Um, pretty important goal in my mind. So the data required um, for my project is primarily going to be based on Landsat imagery um, and that'll be for the time period of interest 1986 to 2016 and I'm going to use that to construct an annual uh, once a year Landsat time series for the area of interest and all the imagery will be the level one product which the US GS in their publications has indicated that is suitable for uh, time series analysis. And, and the scenes will have to be captured in June, July, and August to correspond with peak growing season and that, that being able to differentiate vegetation, uh, healthy vegetation from water should help uh, pick out those water bodies as they'll appear sort of darker in the near infrared composite like the image on the right hand of the screen and um, for processing sake I required um, less than 10 percent cloud cover obviously there'll be some cloud cover but um, just for processing sake the um, any this the least amount of cloud cover the better so for my 30 years worth of data it encompasses three spacecraft systems landsat 5 7 and 8 all of these have the 30 meter grid size so additional data sets i will be using the national ag statistics service cropland data layer that describes crop cover in the area of interest in a 30 meter resolution and that's available specifically for south dakota from 2006 to 16 in a grid format and uh, the national land cover database also will be used that's a 30 meter uh, grid also and the most current on that one is 2011 um, prior to that it was 2006 but I decided to go with 2011 since it was more current 
And then the uh, climate precipitation data, I'm using a PRISM climate data source from that's built out of the University of Oregon. And they produce that in an 800 meter grid. And um, they have many more years than I'm gonna need. So 1895 to 2016, so my 30 years during my time period of interest should be uh, easily attainable from that. So my methods on pre-processing this data, um, first uh, acquire the Landsat scenes from the Earth Explorer, the USGS um, spatial data portal. And then I need two different to create uh, composite band rasters since Landsat 5 and 7 are thematic mapper or enhanced thematic mapper, the band combinations are the same. Whereas the Landsat 8 uses the OLI sensor, so there's a little bit difference. So that's the divergence there is I need to, there's just um, different band combinations required for creating the near infrared composites. And since the imagery doesn't cover the entire area, multiple scenes will be required and I'll stitch those together using a mosaic method, clipping them to the South Dakota prairie pothole region, the area of interest. And then finally, produce the final output being a clipped and com uh, composite raster disp uh, for the area of interest. Similarly, acquiring the national cropland data layer from the U.S. or the uh, Ag Statistics Service, clipping that to the area of interest. And there's many uh, different, uh, I guess classifiers within that. So I'm just going to reclassify that to suit the needs of my project for open water crops, wetlands developed, land, grassland, and pasture, and then clip that to um, the, the final output would be then the clipped layer for that. Then acquire the cropland data layer clipped to the area of interests, and then the final output being the clipped final product of that. So a big part of my project, um, the pre-processing will be done in ArcGIS, and I'm going to extract the water bodies from the Landsat imagery using an object-based image analysis approach, specifically using the eCognition software package. And I guess I just wanted to mention how that differs from any classifying that you may have done based on pixels is eCognition segments the image into these into image objects, which are actually based on neighboring pixels with similar spectral values. So you're working with a higher, I guess, unit of analysis, which I found to be pretty helpful in previous work. And while this method approach has been used extensively to detect change in forests and cropland, we have not seen anything in the literature that suggests it's been used to um, classify water bodies on a large scale. So just some background on how this works. You start with a source image uh, that you then um, get into the segment. You segment the image or split the image up into those uh, image objects. And then you can classify these image objects into groups. So the image on the uh, right would be the final product of all these objects classified as water where the green lines are water from the scene. So to calculate um, the Landsat to classify the water, I'm using a method called the Normalized Difference Water Index, first proposed by McFeeders in 1996. And that calculates um, as the green bands less than near infrared divided by the green band plus near infrared. So what that does for you is any image objects with the NDWI of less than zero are bright objects, which would then be not uh, applicable to being associated with a water classification. Alternatively, objects with an NDWI of greater than zero would be dark objects, which would be water. So the image on the right is the final uh, water body digitized with the objects merged into one seamless area. So just to getting into the methods of how I'm going to classify the imagery, um, again, just um, pre-processing done in ArcGIS, followed by the classification steps within eCognition, segmenting or creating those uh, image objects, calculating the NDWI values, assigning objects with NDWI of greater than zero as water, and then in previous work, it's generally accepted that even though some 
uh, neighboring objects may not have an DWI value appropriate to be classified as water alone. If they share a reasonable border, you can put them into that class with a pretty good understanding of that they are actually water. And then you have to merge these objects into um, one seamless image. And then I'm going to try to separate out seasonal water bodies from permanent so you can compare the NDWI values from one year to the next in eCognition with the final product being a polygon shape file that you can then ex import into ArcGIS. So after importing into ArcGIS, just in visually inspecting and doing any correction to the classification, I'll perform an accuracy assessment. Then I decided to incorporate just a field ground truth since I live fairly close to this area, just seeing how my um, classification shakes out in person and that would result in the final water body classification. So bringing this all data together at a high level, um, there's a lot more steps than are gonna be depicted here, but this is just a high level. So you start with your water body polygons and then overlay that to the crop land data layer, which would then tell you what crops are present in areas that had previously been flooded. And then to calculate any land area changes, the National um, Land Cover Database overlaid over the polygons to then determine what um, has existed, what is now water, or alternatively, what is now not water. And then to correlate water body um, size with precip data, I'll take the water body polygon surface area, compare that to the prism climate data and run a regression analysis, probably in, in the statistical package R uh, to see if there's any significant relationship there. Some, some initial results just on the Landsat classification. These three images are just simply digitized, uh, a digitized slough, which is a shallow body lake over three years located near Lankford, South Dakota uh, from 1986, 95, and 2016. So just if you just visualize um, at the imagery here, it looks that you can make a reasonable assertion that there is some expansion and then reduction from those three years. And I should mention that all of these images are presented at the same scale. So some initial results, accuracy assessment of my three years. I'm just gonna highlight on three different areas of this table. First, the user's accuracy or the error of commission, which means that these water pixels were included. There were pixels included in the water class that evidently were not water. So 2016, um, fairly low, 33% with that the producer's accuracy or the error of omission or the water body pixels that should have been included in the class that weren't um, 50% for 95. And well, these are sort of alarming. I just kind of went back briefly and revisited my methods for creating this. And I think I may need to revise that a little bit. I don't think it is going to be as, uh, I guess, un unreasonable as these numbers suggest. And the total accuracy um, seems fairly reasonable for this area. So some initial results just on how these water bodies appear to be uh, working out. Uh, my test area near Langford, South Dakota, I calculated the surface area of this uh, slough in 1986 as 318 hectares. 1,315 hectares in 1995 and 518 hectares in 2015. So you can see that with our 30 years here, there, there would be a strong uh, correlation to get some sort of baseline to how what was happening before these pluvial years or these, area, these years of intense precipitation in the area of the early 1990s. So we have a reasonably sized water body, a huge water body, and then one that has shrunk considerably, almost back to where it was in 1986. So the table below that uh, graph is from the PRISM climate data series, uh, just a time series of the uh, precipitation in millimeters for this area. Um, so just visually looking at it, um, it seems pretty reasonable that, you know, our precipitation will mirror eventually what we're seeing in terms of these surface areas. 
so some initial results um, on crop distribution. These crops are now crops are now being grown in areas that were previously flooded in 1995. So I started with what areas were flooded in 1995 and what areas are now have crops in them in 2015. And this is a 10 kilometer study area um, near again Langford, South Dakota. I picked this area because I had spoken to somebody uh, who lived in this area and experienced this phenomenon in the 1990s. This is actually based around a farm place that he owns. So in 1995, of 3,568 hectares of 41,756 hectares of my uh, study area were flooded. And then in 1998, by, by 2015, excuse me, 998 of these areas have been reclaimed or the water has disappeared. So the polygons that are digitized here are the water bodies that existed in 1995. And in the center image, the cyan colored um, areas are areas that no longer have any water present. So this circle uh, in the center of there highlights just a small area of that. So when you look at how, what that does in terms of crops being grown, in 2015, farm producers were able to add 24 hectares of soybeans that were to areas previously flooded in 1995. 23 acres of hectares of hay and 20 hectares of corn. So to quantify that in terms of money, 24 hectares of soybeans is about 150 acres in standard units. And based on yield, average yield for this region, last year at today's prices, that actually would indicate would give the producer an additional $32,000 gross. So when I calculated that, I was like, wow, this is really cool. This is amazing. This is only 10 kilometers. Imagine what it's going to be over the whole study area. So I'm pretty excited to see how this shakes out. And um, just based on uh, knowledge I have of producers in this area, they I know somebody that took out two acre buffer of trees just to farm that. So imagine the opportunity there if more of these areas can be farmed. It's pretty significant. Future direction, just further refine methods, mask cloud pixels, further automate processing, correlate the water body, advance and retreat with climate data, and further predict crop distributions. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, just Dean asks, out of curiosity, why is the area called the pothole region? And that correlates to that notion of the when the glaciers were present here during the last glaciation period, they've dug up the landscape. And this has resulted in an area of kind of low spots and, and depressions throughout it. So interestingly, if you move to the east of this area a little ways, there's the Prairie Coteau region, which is a real, that's where the deposits ended up. So it's really the highest point in eastern South Dakota. So I guess that's why it's called the pothole region is it's just dominated by all these little uh, depressions and basins. And Jennifer asks, is there a cost to reclaim the land after it's underwater? That is a interesting. Uh, that is an interesting question. Um, we sort of went with the idea that the producer would know based on their experience, you know, when they should and should not replant something that had previously been flooded. You know, it, does it have a propensity to flood? Does it have, um, has it had a sufficient amount of time for the soil to dry out and et cetera? So 
um, it, we're just kind of looking, leaving it up to nature, I suppose, just to dictate that. And Michaela asks uh, how I was going to use the national land cover data set versus my own results. And uh, yeah, what I'm gonna do with that is I'm going to use my results from the water bodies that were extracted um, from e-cognition from the Landsat imagery and the national land cover data layer will just be used simply to overlay against my polygons from my uh, water bodies to determine what areas are now being, I, I guess, farmed. So does the, has the land class changed to something other than water in that area. Any final questions? Nope.